Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis, the show for talking about Gnosticism uh, with Gnostics or with folks who we think are interesting to talk to about Gnosticism. And uh, I'm Jason Memo, and here instead of uh, Jonathan Stewart. And uh, with us today, we've also got Sean McCann, who's part of the uh, Apostolic Joanite Church. And uh, we've got also Earl Fontenelle from the Secret History of Western Esotericism podcast. I'm really excited to talk to him today. So uh, yeah. And then Earl. Earl, good to, good to have you on the show. Howdy. Thanks for having me, guys. Much appreciated. Good to be here. Well, likewise. Yeah, it's a, um, I've been, been a big fan listening to your show for, uh, for years now. And um, uh, yeah, I think maybe I'm, I'm already a big fan, but a lot of our listeners maybe for some reason haven't already encountered your work. Do you have like an elevator pitch? Like when you're talking to people like, oh, you have a podcast. What's it about? Can you, uh, can you help uh, mention that? And also how you define the term esoteric? Yeah, it's the, it is. My podcast is a history of ideas podcast looking at this thing they call Western esotericism. Um, and a lot of people who study Western esotericism look at stuff like Ficino and Renaissance Platonism and the work of Jakob Böhme and then uh, get into their occultism and, and you know, modern occult stuff which is all interesting, but none of, but there's roots that go way back with those sorts of things. So that's, we're trying to go back to the roots. So we start in the bronze age and we're now in the fourth century CE plodding along, looking at all the kind of interesting um, people who've contributed to the Western esoteric synthesis. That's kind of the deal. That's the deal. And uh, what I mean by esotericism is a little bit, fuzzy because what i what i mean by it isn't something i always stick to to be honest mm -hmm. but i the the sort of um actually hang on let me just call up the schwepp glossary because I, <laughs> I can actually give you my official definition the term esoteric has many shades of meaning and its exact parameters are hotly debated within the academic study of western esotericism but my podcast de default definition is simply presented as being meant only for the initiated. And so if we unpack that a little bit, information is esoteric if one, it is presented as being accessible only to a select group, and two, if it is presented as being wisdom of a higher order. Now to put that into a concrete context that you, your listeners might be familiar with, if we look at the Apocryphon of John from that we know from Nag Hammadi, it presents itself as an Apocryphon. So it is saying this book is a secret book of John. It's esoteric, right? Because what the book tells us about is a cosmic ascent to uh, the higher reaches of knowledge. And, and this is like angelic wisdom. You know what I mean? So it's A, presented as being accessible only to a select group, even though you can read it in, you know, your uh, the, the, the Nag Hammadi texts in English or whatever. It doesn't matter. The point is it's presenting itself as a secret book. And B, it's not just telling you any old secrets. It's telling you secrets of a qualitatively higher uh, standard, right? That's what mm. separates esotericism in my definition from secrecy, because you can have a secret about, you know, like the code to your combination lock, but that's not something that the angels revealed to you, or that's not something that came to you in an illuminative experience. It's just something you learned. So that's, if you have both those things, the secrecy or the rhetorics of secrecy, and the higher level of knowledge, then you have what I think of as the esoteric. And does that is that generally also combining into a, a sense in which things that are being said are always pointing at something else rather than being literal? No, I wouldn't say so. It, it, you have to be sensitive to the kind of register um, mm. of a given thinker or, I mean, if we look at something like an alchemical emblem book or, you know, an alchemical uh, description of a recipe where every single thing in the recipe is, has a decnomen, like a, a decnom, a uh, cover name. So everything mm. is in code, basically. Obviously, that's an example where that is the case. Uh, but we have lots of esoteric discourse like the Apocryphon of John. I mean, the Apocryphon of John has a strong discourse of ineffability, I would argue. So there's certain... Mm aspects of the uh, experience that's being recorded, which uh, are not going to be captured by the text. And the text sort of acknowledges that this, you know, this very strong idea of the ineffable nature of the, um, the, what's he called? 
the unknown spirit no the um you know the first god the oh. highest god the, yeah. the invisible spirit um right. the invisible spirit yeah. is never going to be you can call him the invisible spirit but then you have to at some point say but he's not really that he's beyond that um but uh so insofar as there's you know when you get into these ideas of philosophic ineffability then anything you say is of course going to not really be is is of course going to be thing. referring to something beyond the text right uh, right and that's yeah, yeah. so it's more of a factor of the of the subject than a than a like a an, a stylistic choice yeah it's it, when you get into what's called, often called apophatic language or also called negative theology but it, it needn't mm -hmm. be theological right you get it in buddhism for example where there's no gods so it's not theological um mm -hmm. when you get into that style of language the kind of um linguistic assumption is that everything has to be taken as an incomplete uh, meaning event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That like, and it's it's you're just trying to wrap a box around enough of it to be helpful. Um, yeah, I think it's it's a little yeah. bit like um, if you imagine a, a, an unknown continent. This is a spatial metaphor, so of course it's not going to do mm -hmm. it justice. But if you have imagine an unknown continent and you don't really know what's there, but you can draw a few rivers in and say. You know, the bit that we're trying to talk about is between these two rivers and this mountain range, but we can't tell you anything yeah. about it, but at least we know where it is vis-a-vis -vis the rivers and the mountain range. It's, it's that sort of thing. So, so classical apophatic uh, language will, will often say, you know, God is uh, definitely not evil, <laughs> right? It won't, right. It won't yeah. necessarily predicate goodness to God because that would be a, an ordinary predication, which is not appropriate, but is definitely not evil. So you can have this sort of negative way of describing something that tells you at least where it isn't or what it isn't. Mm. Well, and this is already kind of sketching into, uh, I think, stuff that is definitely interesting to Gnostics. Um, but uh, it's already, like I would say, it's, it's a pretty much a given for anybody really studying in the field that the Gnostics and Gnosticism are a tricky term. Um, and probably a few of the ancient practitioners would have used that word. It's probably more useful. Uh, my own approach is usually to look at look at it more like a genre or a type of literary theory, um, one that, that you can sort of observe Gnosticism or Gnostic elements in traditions, um, uh, even and especially I would say some traditions that would them, would themselves reject the term. Um, as your podcast is stepping through the centuries, which is part of I think what makes it so so effective what what is your overall sense of gnosticism or like your take on it up to where you've reached in the podcast or like where you kind of see its impact or footprint i don't have one really uh um okay. I, you know i the first thing i did was interview michael williams who's written the book about why we shouldn't why we we mean meaning scholars uh, of religions mm -hmm. should just chuck the term gnostic not because it's meaningless but because it's so problematic that it's more unhelpful than helpful essentially and you know you can listen to this interview i did with him where he he lays his position out much more um carefully than i am here uh be because the term is such a um rich evocative term it means so many different things to so many people this the same reason i i hardly ever use the term mysticism in my mm -hmm. work not because mysticism isn't interesting but it because it means totally different things to different people. And if if I'm using a word and you're using the same word, but we th we're thinking of different stuff when we're using it, we're not really communicating very well. Um, so, you know, mysticism can be the um, the sort of William James uh, mystical experience model. But then people talk about like number mysticism. And then, you know, anytime mm -hmm. someone says the 10, of course, represents the Pythagorean tetractus. And so that uh, that's that's mysticism. <laughs> well, what's the connection between those two things? Yeah. So I just don't use it. That's how I feel about Gnosticism. I, I don't really, you know, I'll sometimes use it in the sense like I did an episode on Paul and I was talking about how he um, sees these archons um, sort of in charge of the lower realms of reality and he thinks that's a real problem. And I said, wow, that's really Gnostic. In the, but then I just qualify it in the sense that some people think of Gnosticism as being characterized by a, a highly dualist um, cosmology in which the lower world or the world furthest from God is uh, ruled by archons, archontes, rather than by God directly, this sort of thing. So I'm not really invested in 
defining it or using it as a second order term. It is useful as a first order term when you're talking about someone like Clement of Alexandria, who is like the only actual ancient Christian who just very consistently says, Gnostic, Gnos, you know, we are the Gnostics. We're looking for Gnosis. This is what we're mm-hmm. about. Um, and like he's using not the, the actual guy. word. Yeah, yeah. And and using yeah. it as a kind of identity marker. Like we, mm-hmm. the, there's all the Christians and within that that body, there are certain people who are ready for the real stuff, the, the inner teachings that are harder to understand, that you need some training for. Perhaps you need a lot of training to really get to this stuff. And this is the gnosis. And that's that's mm-hmm. what I'm writing. That's my main subject. Um, and you're going to have to dig pretty hard in my works to get at that stuff because I've hidden it intentionally. <laughs> I have a, I have a kind of uh, Sean? Re, 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 sort of related question because Jason Jason asked you about uh, kind of what's your what's your kind of aerial bird's eye thirty thousand feet kind of view Gnosticism. There's a thing um, the AJC does an annual conclave every year. It has for the last twenty or so. And we've had we've had a handful of scholars talk about the the Apocryphon of John, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, Berger Pearson, uh, Zlako mm-hmm. Plasia, uh, Karen King, and whatnot have all come out to conclave to talk about the thing. And we started asking the after after Dr. Pearson, we started asking the same question from the tail end of of that talk to the other to the other speakers to kind of get their take on it. And as you're full up in it, I wanted to I wanted to hit you with that question. It only popped into my head spontaneously, so forgive me if it isn't uh, in our list. Um, you know, and this might be tough to say because as as you've just noted, right? There's a lot of there's a lot of differences, you know, in terms of uh, Gnostic groups and sects. And Jason mentioned whether or not they would even be identified as such. Um, at least. Let's take the apocryphon as, as the reference point. The the question would be, you know, do you see that as kind of you know full on kind of unmitigated dualism or a kind of qualified dualism or qualified monism or straight up monism that that type of thing? What's your what's what's your take? On great question. That? Yeah. What's your what's your um, your take on that? That's a really great question. I've recently been trying to think through uh, monism and dualism and all that kind of stuff. And it seems to me that dualism is kind of like a flavor. It's not really a theological position. You know, uh, you can get a, um, like a, like a radical Protestant American evangelical, for example, who believe, uh, allegedly believe in, the, the strict Bible message, and they, they've never read the Apocryphon of John. And if they did, they would think it was inspired by Satan. But these guys, actually, if you if you listen to what they say and what they're thinking about, not they as a group, but like an, one individual example, in imaginary example, they're way more interested in the devil than they are in God. They see demons everywhere. They're totally obsessed with evil. Uh, the you know, So they're as dualist as hell. And then you can look at someone who's meant to be a strong, du- either a total dualist or a mitigated dualist, uh, depending on your take on Manichaeism, right? Look at an ma- ancient Manichae, mm. and they're, all they're on about is light. It's just light, 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 good, 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 God all the time. So they're totally not dualist, even though their theological position is allegedly a, a really hardcore dualism. So I feel like dualism and non-dualism are kind of a flavor, uh, kind of a, a matter of emphasis in a way. and. I think there is dualism in the DNA of all forms of Christianity, it seems to me. And that's something we can maybe, you can uh, ask me to justify why I feel that way. Uh, (laughs) But uh, it it can then go go to extremes or it can be almost negligible and not existing. What you don't seem to get is, I mean, and this this shows up in already in the Contra Kelsum or in in Kelsus's attack on on Christianity, early second century, probably, right? He's saying, you guys have misunderstood the Greek myth of the Titans and posited this sort of <laughs> evil force, which you call Satan or whatever. And uh, we Greeks don't have that. Or we uh, traditional followers of the true account don't have that because he's a perennialist. Now, what he's looking what he's looking at is the discourse of the devil, right? Already in the second century. So it's there. 
Um, and it, it's certainly there in Paul, this idea of uh, a kind of like dark forces. But so I don't know if that answers your question. I feel like. So would, um, it, would it be a fair, if, if I were to kind of, you know, uh, um, you know, as I'm famously, uh, you know, uh, non-academic kind of thing, we always preface our stuff with, I'm not a scholar, but so to, yeah. to kind of, kind of, uh, you know, summarize back to see if I've the accurate thing that, that dualism, uh, you know, in, in classical Gnosticism and maybe more specifically in the Apocryphon of John is more like a, uh, uh, an eye of the beholder, uh, type yeah. of thing. Well, it's an eye of the writer yeah. initially, because some of these guys are super dualist and some of them aren't. And then it's the eye of the reader and what, what are they getting from the text? And if, if they, you know, if you have already um, an idea of, of a, an insane deranged child demiurge and you approach something quite innocuous, like uh, from Nag Hammadi or from the, I mean, if you want to read uh, the new Testament with the assumption that there's an insane deranged child demiurge, you'll find it in the new Testament and yeah. you'll be, you'll be super dualist in your Christianity whilst but but the apocryphon of John, I feel like just just to take that text, is um, you could describe it as dualist. You could also describe it as um, fundamentally monist in a strong philosophic sense of monism. Like you know, there's a reason that the the readers of Zostrianos and Ologenes were hanging out in Plotinus's school in Rome. And Plotinus is, if you want monism, that's about as monist as you can get. You yeah. know, that would be like the the Western equivalent of Advaita Vedanta. Like this, there just is fundamentally no multiplicity on in a certain sense, right? Um, so in that sense, they're they're probably way less dualist than your garden or common or garden uh, Christian. I was gonna say there's a there's there's an interesting discussion to be had at at some future point about kind of you know how uh, how a writer intends their art uh, versus how a reader uses the art of the, yeah. the the writer type of thing and, and what they intended and kind of how that actually came out when the when the rubber hit the road type of thing yeah be an interesting exploration well yeah plato warned us about that in the phaedrus he said you know once you've written <laughs> something down and sent it out there all bets are off and he's right people do whatever they want uh, with th there's a there's something that um uh jonathan stewart is uh one you one of the the main hosts for talk Gnosis, and he's mentioned an idea that uh, uh, one way of looking at Gnosticism, despite its dualist uh, reputation, is actually as like a sort of a deeply qualified monism, um, yeah. uh, sure. because there is like, you know, if 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 we're presuming that there is this thing that's beyond and past everything, well, that's monism, you know. Yeah, <laughs> um, it just happens 100%. to get detailed underneath I think, but, yeah. I think and I, I can't remember so I'd have to go back I mean the lectures are all on uh, on YouTube but I think it was either Dr. Pearson or Dr. Pleasure that one one of them said um, that you know from the from the perspective of the ineffable in the text it's monism from the perspective of the reader it's dualism that's a really good way of approaching yeah. it and that that kind of um addressing point of view is something that we moderns are very good at, but I've never really found it in ancient writing. So for example, I would say that if you're reading Plotinus, um, one of the things that I'm very interested in, in uh, ancient Platonism is the, the idea that um, soul is, as we know, not um, material and it's non-corporeal. But then in the Timaeus, Plato kind of says that the world soul is basically turning the sphere of the fixed stars in the, in the cosmos. So it's kind of has a place. It's kind of located in a material spot. And um, that actually, the, the, they don't say this, but what I think what they're getting at, a later reception of this, is from the perspective of an embodied human on the earth looking up, the world soul has a location in the sky from the perspective of soul or noose it doesn't right so they, they don't put it that way and i think if they did things would be much easier for us to understand but there is a lot of this kind of it depends on which aspect of the human being and and for someone like uh the author of the apocryphon of john the human is going to have 
a potential uh, aspect which is very high indeed ontologically, which which whose home is not down here in the um, the earthly realm. So from that perspective. Uh, you can have, you know, a human whose whose roots or whose leaves or whatever are growing up into the hypercosmic realms, where y you can say that, like, for example, all multiplicity doesn't exist. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because if you're in the presence of the one, where's multiplicity? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Getting back to the scholars you mentioned, so uh, and back to the earlier question of defining Gnosticism. So Berger Pearson and uh, Pleche, if that's how you say his name, uh, my buddy Bill, Dylan Burns, and many others have are a respectable scholarly tradition who do want to talk about Gnosticism, and very specifically as a, a group of uh, some kind of loose ancient movement who are behind the texts that are often grouped together as Sethian texts, the Apocryphon of John, the Zostrianos, Three Steles of Seth, and a few others that we have from Nag Hammadi. And probably on balance of probability, these guys were either calling themselves Gnostics or talking a lot about Gnosis. And if you want to use that kind of very limited-ish um, term, it's a you know there's there's plenty of good scholarly reasons to do that. Um, so in that sense, if you said were there actual Gnostics, I would say yeah, I'd probably happy to go along with the idea that the group roughly known as the Sethians is probably the Gnostics in antiquity with some outliers and some, some funny guys who don't fit at all, like uh, Clement of Alexandria, also using the same terminology. Um, this, uh, this actually kind of makes me, um, so I, I had a question in here. I think we've already kind of addressed it about the nature of like, if Gnosticism is sort of uh, esoteric in its general nature, like I think, um, mm. It, it seems to me maybe the the answer to that but that might be just a leading question <laughs> sounds like yeah <laughs> uh because we're always any kind of discussion of gnosis is always going to be limited because you can't fully wrap your your description around the whole thing um but uh yeah so well i mean i guess i've asked the question even though i've said it, we've already answered it. It, it would you say that's a that's a fair assessment of of uh like gnosticism always having a, an esoteric lens or an esoteric flavor um depending on what you want to consider gnosticism uh <laughs> true the, um there's certainly it's certainly the case that of the early like say early christian writings um the ones the the ones that call themselves secret like the apocrypha um tend to more to be Gnostic, arguably, than not. Well, no, no, I don't buy that. It's nonsense. <laughs> Look, Paul, Paul is is meant to be mainstream Christianity, and he's going on about mysteries constantly. Mysterion in Greek in his day. Okay, he is partly getting the term from the Septuagint Bible, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, which was the most widely read. Uh, form of the Old Testament to Hellenize Jews like Paul in the Roman Empire. Mysterion there has, is often used to translate a Hebrew word, which I think is sod, which is secret. If it's not sod, if sod means like pencil or something in Hebrew, I apologize. Um, <laughs> so, but, but in Greek, it has, it basically means secret. So forget about mysticism, forget about all the kind of semantic spin-offs of the term mysterion in English and cognate languages. Uh, mysterion just means secret. So, and he's on about secrets all the time. Mysteria. And th these the secrets are things like Christ's death and saving power, um, the, the, uh, uh, the arreta that he learned, that someone learned in the third heaven in 2 Corinthians. There's a lot of, of rhetorics of secrecy and hiding in Paul. So is Gnosticism more esoteric than Paul? No. Um, <laughs> if we look at the Gospel of John, uh, esotericism right in the beginning, right? So first, en arche en hologos, kai hologos en prostonteon, etc. Then, and he was in the world and the world knew him not, right? 
So we're already mm-hmm. invoking a secret mission. Christ comes down, but he, if this is Christ, which seemingly it is, uh, but no one knows, recognizes who he is. So there's this like secret Christian entry into the world. That's super Gnostic, right? The, mm-hmm. the, the descent of Christ where he has to sneak through all the different archons down to the earth. So no one knows he's coming. This is, this is played out in a few uh, of the, the non-canonical texts, which are often considered Gnostic. So uh, I think the Christian canon as it, and let's remember the Christian canon doesn't exist in first, second, third, fourth centuries. Really? It's, it's, in, it's a work <laughs> in progress. The Christian canon is full of esotericism. It's already right. the mainstream Christianity is super esoteric. Yeah, so like Gnosticism doesn't have a have a uh, a hold on being esoteric. Absolutely not. What arguably it does have in certain high octane texts that we have from Nag Hammadi, like Zostrianos and Alogenes, and the Apocryphon of John, is a very strong discourse of ineffability, mm. which which you don't find in Paul. And I think you don't really find in John uh, enough, like the idea that God's nature escapes the ability for humans to even discuss, to even cognize, to use the epistemologically, we cannot even grasp this transcendent invisible spirit or unnamed first God, you know, the hidden one, etc. That you get a lot. You get that in Valentinianism as well. Mm-hmm. The, um, the idea of a totally transcendent God. And that brings with it, if you take it seriously and you get poetical with it, if you, if you engage with it on the level of text, instead of just saying, God is ineffable, we can't talk about him, but you, you dive into that and start talking about him, right? Which is what some of these <laughs> texts do. That gets very esoteric. This actually might be a great uh, segue. Um, I do have a, I do have uh, a into... follow-up, sorry. The, yeah, please okay. do. The, the, uh, uh, and this might get controversial or it might be it might be too broad so then would it be fair to say in christianity's early days that kind of the original manifestation of christian esotericism is gnosticism or is esotericism so fundamentally baked into kind of christianity as originally conceived you know the idea of christianity as a mystery cult kind of thing as to make them uh, what's the word uh indistinguishable like it, like you know, is it uh, you know, is it in the is it in the body or is it in the blood? I guess, for lack of a better phrase. Um, your question presupposes a Gnosticism separate from early Christianity, which I don't necessarily <laughs> believe in. Uh, if I, I feel like early Christian, the, the the beauty and fascination and extraordinariness of early Christianity is it was a total kind of messy anarchic social movement with hundreds if not thousands of of variant texts floating around and different groups that are all cut off from each other with whatever texts showed up in their town whatever weird itinerant preachers showed up whatever local prophets getting messages and they're all coming up with what this thing is that we're doing right is supposed to be so um who are the Gnostics and who are the Christians in that context? If we're talking about like the first four centuries, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. um, even after Nicene, uh, I mean, after the council of Nicaea is when the Nag Hammadi texts were written down. So if we imagine this monastic or other isolated group of, uh, very intense thinkers, Christians out in the desert, <laughs> collecting texts, um, they didn't get the memo about trinitarianism <laughs> yeah. and the the credo right and uh, and they probably didn't get the memo for another few hundred years probably islam conquered egypt before they got the memo you know what i mean so the gnostics are not necessarily separate i mean if we look at the look valentinus almost became bishop of rome yeah <laughs> this i mean the uh, one thing that um, uh, jonathan has said in previous episodes has been that like the uh, essentially like when we when we look at the the Bible as we know it, it's like these were the esoteric spiritual like um, fan fictions being passed around that ended up either being the most popular or 
having the biggest publisher you know they like they kind of ended up having the biggest footprint but uh yeah. but kind of going back to your point of like there was this like incredible multiplicity of of explorations on the theme on like riffing on the subject kind of thing like i said earlier like if you decide to find define gnosticism as a genre like christianity itself as a genre that like a lot of writers are writing in and then like you know who ends up lasting kind of thing there yeah and i, I was going to mention the so that that leads me and this will be my last follow-up question sorry i know we've got questions on the thing but it's just the uh the opportunity to to pick your brain because i'm such a fan of your podcast is just irresistible so some 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 but not not all some some scholars if i recall and i can't remember if it is pearson who we talked about previously but there are you know in addition to the dualism monism question people have different ideas then on whether or not there was a pre-christian gnosticism like the idea of you know yeah. uh you know, uh, uh, pre-Christian, you know, second century BC Alexandrian type of mingling, you know, mingling of, of, of ideas type of thing that eventually, eventually, you know, four centuries or whatever later, you know, has its kind of remembered expression through the lens of Christianity. So I guess kind of based right. on your earlier answer, would it be fair to say that you're, you're a hard no in the, in, to the question of a, no. a pre-Christian Gnosticism? Pre-Christian Gnosticism. I'm, I'm a, not enough of a scholar of Gnosticism to answer that one. I'm, I'm aware of the question. I'm aware that the idea of pre-Christian Gnosticism was very trendy for a while, and now it's definitely out of favor in the majority of scholarship. Um, but I cannot, I'm, I'm nowhere near, um, skilled enough with all the texts to be able to pronounce on it. Um, that, that all Christianity and all its flavors will have drawn on lots of earlier Jewish material, which we might want to call apocalyptic in its basic mindset or, you know, Enochic and so on. That's clear enough. The Enochic story brings in a certain dualism to Judaism and Christianity, which wasn't necessarily there before, because you have these sort of evil um, watcher figures who are in the earth and they're messing with stuff and the divine order has been messed up, which you could argue is a prefiguring of the, the fall of Sophia, right? But mm -hmm. was there a pre-Christian Sophia myth that then got Christianized or Jewish Christianized or whatever? Maybe. I don't know. I don't see any compelling reason to think there was, but I wouldn't be surprised to find out that there was as well. Interesting. Thank you. This uh, this actually reminds me of um, Houston Smith gave a lecture um, ages ago that I found online, which was a uh, I think he called it uh, Gnosticism: A Western Path Towards Asia. Like he, so it, it's it's kind of an introduction to Gnosticism, but he makes this interesting point that there's like big G Gnosticism, which is like more definably like among the texts and the people using the term Gnosis, that kind of thing. And then small g Gnosticism, which he defines as like a type of approach, which uh, is like how that's how his like how his term comes along there of like a Western path towards Asia of like this way of go of like looking at apophatically um, that is being wrapped around the the myths and culture of the of the area it's in, um, and so it's more about like if you're a small G Gnostic, then you're going to bring that kind of approach to whatever culture you're in, if that makes sense. Sure. Gnosticism as a way yeah. of thinking. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, and then the pedantic historian of ideas in me comes forward and says, <laughs> yes, that is a real thing, the Gnostic way of thinking, but it means different things to different people. And therefore, you want to be really careful when you just casually say, Gnosis or Gnosticism, because are we talking about the author of the Apocrypha of John, or are we talking about a way of thinking, or are we talking about exactly. both? And it, it gets super yeah. uh, fuzzy and murky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've got, you know, I, I've got a, a thought about that, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna save that to maybe the end of the show if we still got time. Um, the uh, one thing that I think maybe in terms of in terms of that notion of characterizing Gnosticism. Um, uh, I'm going to get into an into an episode that uh, I think it was on the third century, but you can correct me if I'm wrong there. But I, I noted that, that uh, you were telling sort of the, in the history 
that Christians of this period were starting to really like see what they were trying to do as not just true for them, but true for like, it had to be true for everyone. It wasn't just like, this is my God. This is like your God, even if you don't believe in it. Um, and that struck me as kind of a notable shift in the sort of the, the marketplace of ideas of the ancient yeah. world. Um, and then particularly when imperial power got involved, like now it's like, it has to be true for everyone. And you're going to essentially, you know, pay taxes to that effect. Um, uh, where I'm kind of going with this is like, uh, is like, I, I think a lot of Gnosticism today uh, is uh, especially like when it really kind of hit the road in the, in the, like, I don't know, last 60 years or so was seeing Gnosticism as this rebelliousness um, from this like universal truth. It was like a, it was a way of re like a re rebelling within a Christian mindset. And I'm, I'm talking more in the current day, but is that like, is, is that, is that coming from that, that uh, earlier uh, shift towards a universal truth? Um, and that did like, did, did that, did that force a kind of esotericism on other ideas? The, if we look at ancient esotericism, um, <clears throat> there is a minority of esoteric writing that is expressed esoterically for fear of persecution that does exist. But there's not that much of it. The, the vast majority of esotericism is public uh, statements of secret wisdom, right? So there's this paradoxical publicity thing. And in fact, one <laughs> of the best ways to get publicity in the spiritual marketplace is to say you have secret wisdom, right? Um, mm -hmm. We only need to look at The Secret, one of the most <laughs> widely read New Age books in the world. And it's called The Secret. It's, it is what it, you know, what it says on the tin. Um <laughs> But there is that, you know, persecution comes into stuff. In the fourth century, you did have cr literally Christian mobs going around trashing the place and like beating up people. And then later mm -hmm. on, you have sort of hardcore warfare between different flavors of Christian, the, the so-called Aryan controversy in retrospect, right? In the fourth century, where you have literally armies in the field. One side are Aryans, one side are trinitarians and they're they're going at it um so that all that stuff is there in late antiquity um but and the imperial status of christianity when it becomes the imperial cult is something that is very important um uh, you know everything changes when you become an imperial cult it seems to me the same that you lose one impression I get from early Christianity is it's quite anarchic in many ways. And so th this is where that kind of Gnosticism as counterculture idea um, that, mm -hmm. that some scholars still think it really was the, the case on the ground. So, so Christianity was already in the second century, say, becoming this kind of institutionalized thing. And you had bishops and you had this kind of authority, this more and more centralized authority happening. And the Gnostics were the counterculture. They were like the 60s like stick it to the man, uh, spiritual movement, uh, uh April DeConnick, th that's a, a caricature of, of, of something that she argues with much more, um, rigor and, uh, verve and, uh, subtlety than I've just said. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like that's what Christianity was in the, er I mean, Christianity was, um, open to women and slaves, right? There's one of the many mm -hmm. critiques. When we get early critiques of Christianity, one of them is often a kind of social elitist critique of like, look at these gutter trash in their, you know, <laughs> conventicles. And it's like women and slaves can be Christians. And they, they, don't, they don't value paideia. They don't value rhetoric. They don't value any of the kind of traditional Roman accomplishments. Uh, what a bunch of trash. And I think that, you know, they were, to some degree, early Christianity was a movement of like upstart trash, which has a very strong social uh, significance for the Roman Empire, right? Um, mm -hmm. And when you start to get the imperial power involved, you start to get people formulating an idea of a Roman imperial Christianity where you can be like the praetor and or even the emperor and yet a Christian. And so the, the whole kind of Roman social hierarchies, which are very strong 
right? The Romans are a very hierarchical culture gets imposed onto Christianity. And that messes with that earlier vibe of we're all doing this together and we're all equal. And um, which I think was one of the, was on the social side was probably one of the um, really powerful fired up things about Christianity that got pe people so excited. You know, it was a mm. way out of the, of the social strictures of the Roman empire to some degree anyway. Um, and then like the, uh, uh, not unlike something like say, like if that is that notion, like I've heard people say that like capitalism can co-opt a lot of social movements by finding a way to market it. For sure. <laughs> There's maybe like a similar sense of like, you know, the empire is like, if we can find a way to absorb this, you know? Yeah. Um, channel it. That's what Constantine mm -hmm. did essentially, um, or tried to do. Yeah. He, Constantine yeah. was the Che Guevara t-shirt of Christianity. One could argue. <laughs> that's that's a that's a good that's like a bumper sticker that's a great quote <laughs> um, um or you know the the best-selling rage against the machine album or whatever whatever the, you, know, <laughs> you want to an analogy you want to use um yeah that for sure happened that for sure happened why constantine chose christianity of all the you know why he didn't go for sun cult as the the new hardline imperial cult that's going to unify the empire in this dire crisis we find ourselves in at the beginning of the fourth century why he chose christianity i think but we don't know but my guess is he just really had some kind of profound christian experience and he you know the, the story that he was converted is probably more or less what happened but again that's not something we can prove the only thing we have is like eusebius and some other christian uh hagiographers about constantine and they all tell a different story about how he got converted and stuff so but um, it's hard to see any other reason why he would have plonked for Christianity as the new imperial cult than he well, was a Christian. Yeah. And like, we, we might be kind of getting outside of our lane here in terms of uh, speaking about esotericism, but like one of the things that I found, like, so you, uh, maybe here's a way to connect it. One of the things that your podcast reminds me of is uh, Mike Duncan's History of Rome podcast, mm -hmm. uh, which is that it it's a, sort of an exhaustive travel through the history sort of from beginning to end um uh as a as a long form exploration and what what that gains you is a is an ability to see the development of ideas and the development of like a um, it, as you were saying like texts influencing other texts and yeah faiths being influenced by previous faiths um that like but like one of the things i recall in there was that like the reason halos are in and i might be mis misquoting this but like the reason we see halos is that that was them using sun god iconography on Christian saints, and uh, as a, in a in an almost in a very Roman way of saying, hey, these saints are kind of like the sun gods you're worshiping. Like, let's all just kind of work hmm. together. Um, uh, so, like in in some respects, maybe it was like a little less of like instead of the Roman Empire becoming Christian, it was maybe a little more of Christianity getting added into the portfolio of the of the overall, you know. Uh, that uh, that happened for sure and it happened with judaism yeah. already for hundreds of years right Every, yeah. everyone knows the um the palestinian uh antique and late antique synagogues that we find with these mosaic pavements and they all show uh the god helios the sun god in the middle often with a zodiac around him not always um there's there's several of these they're very famous they're in palestine these are these are jewish synagogues right from antiquity mm -hmm. what the hell are they these jews putting the sun god on the floor of their uh, synagogue for and a lot has been written about this and it's all speculative and so on but probably it was something along the lines of hey we got some money together to make a synagogue let's make a really good synagogue uh we got this mosaic guy he he specializes in helios with the with the zodiac wicked go for <laughs> it let's do it you know um they didn't see it as a problem uh, when early, you know, we see Christ in early iconography depicted as Apollo or with, you know, with all the attributes of Apollo, he's in a chariot, the chariot, it's the chariot of the sun. Uh, why? Well, it's not like someone said, who let's, let's make a syncretic move so we can bring Apollo into the Christian fold. It's just like, I'm going to depict Christ. Like he's kind of solar. Uh, I know how to draw Apollo. I'm going to draw Christ as Apollo, you know, it, it's, 
it's just the way you draw a solar deity and you know that's, mm -hmm. that's how it went i think well and hey like maybe we'll draw this god guy like kind of like zeus maybe yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know I I've heard I've heard it characterized that you know Rome is a Greek reenactment society, right? And so I, you know, so I wonder is there is there? I mean, we've all heard the stuff about you know the uh, adoption or usurpation of you know Roman symbolism to to Christianity, the empire never ended type of stuff, right? But I mean, is there is there a certain amount of you know I guess intentional ingratiation in order to make itself you know, familiar. We know some of the early patristic writers, you know, uh, phrased Christianity through the lens of Greek philosophy. Was that because, was that, was that, and I don't know philosophy worth a damn, so forgive me if I drive into a ditch, but is, is that, you know, is that something because it's a good way to explain their ideas or is that an attempt to speak somebody else's language? Like, were they, were they in, intentionally doing stuff, you know, to, I guess, to, uh, um, you know, were they trying to Romanize their Christianity or or Christianize Rome? I guess it depends That's on where I was going with that. But I hope you get the idea. Well, if it's a it's a really interesting question, and it it, it varies. So Justin Martyr, writing in, I think in the early second century in Rome, it, it writes an apologetic, and he's writing for a non Christian audience. First of all, saying why Christians are not scary and evil and not sacrificing babies and please don't persecute us. You know, that's one part of his message. But another part of his message is, and actually, we have the we levels. are, yeah. we have the, yeah, yeah, exactly. We, you know, all that stuff you think you get from philosophy, we've got that and even better. So, um, you know, philosophy in late antiquity is, of course, a spiritual uh, marketplace itself. It's, a, it's, it's, it's presented as a way of life and it's thought of as a way of life not as a kind of you know a system of beliefs or whatever a system of thinking and uh christianity is in justin martyrs trying to put itself on that footing for a non-christian audience and so uh, clement of rome the first uh maybe the first bishop the first pope the first bishop of rome uh, he's from a really well-born christian family or non-christian family sorry a, a, a well-born polytheist roman established family related to the emperor tiberius according to the legends whether that's true or not it doesn't matter the point is he's a posh pagan right uh he's like of the first generation of posh pagans who saw something in this christianity in this this simple preaching of peter and these other jews from palestine who are coming and saying we've got this vibe like this new message check it out they're seeing something in it that they really like so that's happening but also you get someone like clement of alexandria who expounds uh, Christianity, I think his his in the in the stromates his his intended uh, audience is Christians. It's not an apologetic work. It's definitely written for fellow Christians who want to get deeper into it. And he's not only bringing in all kinds of philosophy, but he's bringing in he'll he'll quote some Euripides or some Homer um, as a way of explicating the scriptures. So it just comes naturally to him. He's a well educated Greco Roman. It comes naturally to him to quote a bit of Euripides. Do you see what I mean? So there's yeah. different ways of engaging mm -hmm. with this cultural legacy. Um, but I, before, like I, so I was, I'd asked a, sort of, a, or I, I gave a, a pricey and then got into the, this question about like the, if the operating is true, created esotericism. I guess I want to make sure that I, do I have that right in terms of the, that it was odd for Christianity, um, maybe before or after it became imperial to try to define itself as true for for even non-believers was that like was that a, a a really unique thing yeah it was a very in my view a very big turning point uh that's never happened before in the west before that moment when this discourse of what 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 just monotheism really monotheism but universalist monotheism because the jews in the hellenistic period had arguably gone from being henotheist roughly speaking to monotheist in the sense that they're saying that their god is the only god but they're not trying to convert you almost exclusively. They, they almost never try to convert anyone in this period. They're just refusing to worship anything other than their God. Uh, and this partly came about because Jews who had, had learned Greek philosophy and, and combine, you know, if you combine Plato's idea with, of an actual objective ultimate truth with 
the Hebrew scriptures, you come up with something like a universal monotheism, right? Uh, mm. But with Christianity, the, the sort of iron jackboot form of Christianity that arises in the Constantinian period in a, a, in a small sector of Christians, but then kind of spreads and spreads and spreads till we get the sort of medieval um, you, total universalism and total intolerance of what they call heresy, which again, we don't want to overdraw that because it's not like medieval Christians were actually like that, but that's the sort of ideological framework that I don't mm -hmm. think anyone's ever seen anything like that in the ancient Mediterranean world before. The, the notion just wouldn't have occurred to anyone that this could be the case. And this is where you get not only the Christian martyrs whose, whose numbers have, you know, it's, it's well attested now that their numbers were overblown and, and the martyrologies were a bit fictional and all that good stuff, but there still were Christian martyrs. And some of them were martyred because they would, for example, absolutely refuse to make a sacrifice uh, or to eat meat mm. that had been sacrificed because this was seen as like ritually impure. Uh, that's a kind of hard line stance, which is like, there is only one truth and I'd rather die than um, go against it. And then the more aggressive form of that is once Christianity gets in power, they say, I'd rather kill than allow you to go against I'd it. I'd rather you die and that's than I go against it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that, does, the, that is uh, a reality, uh, you know? It's a historical reality. Yeah. And it's, I, I see it as a real turning point. I want to... Um, you know, I don't want to overstate it and make a caricature of it, but I do think that something really shifted in the West when that idea was sort of imperialized or weaponized even when through the fusion of church and state in the fourth century. Mm -hmm. And you suddenly had this idea that like, there's one truth and it's really, really important that everyone follows it. That's if that's mon that's universalist mon monotheism, to mm -hmm. to my understanding of the term. The term monotheism doesn't just mean you think there's only one god, uh, because if that is what it means, then all the Platonists, for example, are monotheists. But no, everyone talks about the oh, the Hermetica are monotheist, right? But they're not. They're considered polytheist, and the reason is they're easygoing about the fact that there's <laughs> there's only one god. But it doesn't matter what you worship. We're not worried about you know if you worship the moon, that's irrelevant because there's only we know there's only one eternal uh first cause uh and you can worship the moon and you can worship some daimones and you can do whatever you want it's cool so that's the polytheist <laughs> sort of mindset as it were the monotheist mindset says hell no we're going to yeah. take measures to make sure you don't worship the moon yeah yeah well and so this is actually might be an interesting way to lead into my next question but before i even do that i'm going to do a quick reminder for anybody listening uh, about uh, supporting Tognosis. Um, we, we do this show um, with the support of our listeners. And so we have a Patreon. Um, you can go, I think, to, um, you know, I'm going to get it wrong. So rather than say where to say wrong, I'm going to say Google Tognosis, go to our website. There's a support Tognosis uh, link there that's got a link to all of our Patreon tiers and things like that. Um, we're thinking about, um, we used to uh, have a thing where we release, we can, we can charge you as we release media or I think we're changing that now to just a flat rate, so then we don't have to worry about how much we're releasing. But um, yeah, if you if you're enjoying this this chat and you want to hear more of it, uh, definitely visit Talknosis and uh, our website and check out the support Talknosis link. And uh, yeah, okay, now back well, onto the show. Is the <laughs> back secret chiefs my... of the AJC are too cheap to do so. I'll talk to the guy. But in the meantime, uh, you know, <laughs> if you can pitch in a buck, fantastic. It's fu it's funny how the secret chiefs are always strapped for cash. I've, this was this was true of the theosophical secret chiefs. It was true, you know. The, you got to go. The, the secret chiefs need rich sort of like capitalists to fund them. This is this is a pattern over time. When, you, when you're dealing you with think, theosophy, the secret chiefs were so cheap they couldn't even afford to write their own letters. Levant yeah. had to do it for them. <laughs> oh dear. It's true. Well, and if the, if the secret chiefs were in charge of everything that they say they were, then you'd think that the money wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> exactly. You'd think Agartha, they'd be like, oh, I just sell one of those golden pillars and we're, we're good for another hundred years. You know what I mean? Like they, they'd be living in like sort of splendid palaces. But maybe the secret chiefs are above all that sort of stuff. They, do, they don't get their hands dirty with well, things yeah. like money. And so you need 
the Annie Hornymans of the world or whatever to, yeah. to come in and, and fund your lodge. <laughs> or uh, in the present day, Patreon subscribers. <laughs> I, yes, well, the, yeah, I look forward to uh, 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 gets, uh, gets into, uh, you know, gets into the modern era. I know it'll be uh, a, a while, but, you know, getting into uh, masonry, the occult revival, theosophy and all that stuff, because that is going to be wild. Yeah, well, we've we've introduced Madame Blavatsky already in a very cool interview. You, the people might not know, but in the Schweb has two simultaneous podcasts. One is the podcast, and one is the oddcast. And the oddcast is where we put all the stuff that doesn't yet fit the chronology. Because why wait fifteen years to to put out a really cool interview about Madame Blavatsky, right? So that's mm -hmm. where you find all this kind of later stuff. And uh, we've we've talked about the good Madame. Um, but there will be a lot more of that stuff filtering in mm -hmm. in the near future. Uh, so I, I want to like uh, jumping off of what we were talking there about the nature of like truth as a as, as a notable change. Um, I think one of the things too, like so as a as just growing up like reading the Bible and like uh, that kind of like there's this sense that like history began right around the time of Christianity because and before that is all vaguely you know classical stuff. Um, and that that a, a lot of I'm trying to find a way to to, to figure out how I'm, where I'm going here is that like a lot of the writings that I've read of esotericism and of um, uh, Gnosticism and even Christianity like they often try to position that their text as the beginning of something, but once I once I've been listening to Schwepp and the more I've been reading esoteric in esoterica in general, I've started to realize how much it is a development of ideas. Um, uh, which I think to me was notable because I think like so many esoterics uh, or esoteric writings and occult writings are always saying, here's the real truth. Here's the secret, <laughs> you know, yeah. as you say. Um, but uh, this is sort of a, um, a tongue in cheek question, but like is essentially the esoteric tra like tradition, the overall history, a series of hot takes. What is a hot take? I don't know what this term <laughs> means. Oh, okay. Um, shoot well, from the hip, off the cuff, that type of thing. Is, oh, okay. is it just a bunch of people kind of responding outlandishly to the last outlandish statement of a competitor, perhaps? Right. Okay. So, so like something like QAnon would be an example of hot takes, right? People just making stuff up and and bouncing off each other and and. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I'm I'm also like in my tongue in cheek way. I think I'm also kind of getting at the 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 fact that or the element that um it feels like a lot of these traditions are writing from the perspective of saying like okay here's what what we knew before or here here's what you thought you knew but here's the real truth here's the new yeah. thing and so there's a this constant sense of reinterpretation um, mm. uh, at the same time often phrased as though and this is the truth and everything else before this was either a lie or we're just not going to talk about it. That's actually a trope that shows up later you know you don't really find that before christianity what you find with christianity is uh, so first of all that's a really interesting question um what you find with christianity <clears throat> is that uh the christian scriptures that end up being canonical are written in this kind of low greek this non-rhetorical non-flowery man in the street greek uh and critics of Christianity and even some Christians like Jerome are kind of appalled by this because it's like, you're saying this is the sacred wisdom of the gods, but we know what, you know, God speaks in hexameter verse. God writes well. <laughs> when God reveals stuff, <laughs> it's in like a high literary form. And you're telling us that this sort of scrawl is meant to be a uh, high, high level spiritual wisdom. Come on, be serious. Now, they Christians dealt with that in different ways, but they generally speaking, they made a strength of it. They said, yeah, like this is a new revelation. All that stuff that came before all that kind of like long traditional, uh, esoteric wisdomy stuff. Isn't the real stuff. The real stuff is like apostolic succession. Like Peter had some wisdom. He gave it to Clement. Clement became the first Bishop of Rome and the church went on from there. It's like this, it's this very young movement. And they had to defend themselves because in the general Greco-Roman mindset, older is better. I'm oversimplifying, but the idea is like yeah. the all the way back in Hesiod, 
with in the written in probably the eighth century BCE with the myth of the the different um, you know the golden age, the silver age, the iron age that we're in now. The old in the old days things were better, and the Romans had a very strong discourse of this. They liked the mus maiorum, the the ways of the ancestors. They were a very conservative culture, and they liked that which was old and went back to the good old days. And the Christians were kind of bringing a new thing, which is, this is esoteric wisdom that doesn't go back to this long immemorial perennial tradition. We have no Orpheus, we have no Pythagoras, we have no ancient Egyptians or Babylonians or Indian gymnosophists. We're just going straight to this guy, Jesus, and boom. And uh, so that is something new. And I think that's kind of relevant to what you're saying. Um, now, some Christians, like Clement, my favorite Christian, uh, they deal with that by saying, actually, Moses is the guy. And Moses is super ancient. And his everything in Moses is 100% supportive of Christianity. And that revelation goes all the way back. And that the, the anything that's good in the Greek tradition like Plato, for example, is just cribbing off Moses and not not sort of uh, citing sources properly. So it's all it's all plagiarized mm -hmm. from Moses. So you can you can construct an ancient wisdom lineage for an esoteric Christianity. Like an ancient and we uh, have, Orientalism. Yes, yeah, you can have that, and you do find that in in antique in patristic literature. But then some some patristic writers take the opposite um, tack and say, no, 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 this is new, and that's part of what's awesome about it. Interesting. And that Interesting. then gives rise to a kind of trope of esotericism that you're, I think, talking about, which is what I call the now revealed for the first time trope, which yeah, yeah, may, exactly. well, may well refer to a total hot take, you know, like just, I just made <laughs> some shit up and this is the wisdom, or it may refer to, and often does refer to just complete recycling of old stuff that's been out there for ages, something like the secret, right? Which is basically just think and grow rich. Uh, new thought stuff from the 1920s from America repackaged and now revealed for the first time the, the true secret to prosperity right um, so it's then it then it's a case of repackaging old stuff and and uh, selling uh, mutton dressed up as lamb kind of thing <laughs> the uh, uh, that reminds me of the amount of uh, hermeticists who keep face palming every time somebody brings up the Kabbalion yeah oh the Kabbalion well that's one of the most uh, important modern hermetica <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping there's a winky face there <laughs> no no but it is because yeah. the all the ancient hermetica were written by people and then they put and none of it was really written by hermes or am i wrong about that true well no it's yeah all that, that's a good point. it's all people writing a thing and then putting the name of hermes on it so the kid yeah, is, is a modern hermetico yeah. yeah that's true <laughs> <laughs> um, would, it be, would it be fair uh, to say in, in relation to this kind of, you know, hot takeism that depending kind of, you know, much like we had earlier, we were talking about the eye of the beholder that, you know, the depending on who's asking and who's doing the telling that you've got a, you know, a convenient dance between things being presented either as iteration or innovation, right? Like, you know, they're either yeah. connecting themselves to something older for the sake of legitimacy but framing themselves as something new for the folks who are bored with that yeah i think and part of the part of that is to do with context so for example the 19th century uh, occultists like the blavatsky's and steiner's and um, the whole kind of spiritualist movement and occultism were living they were living very much in a triumphalist age where the myth of progress and Whig history was, was a dominant thing, you know, like the 19th century, although there was this strong current of 19th century pessimism, nevertheless, people really believed that they were in a, a, an era of progress and that modern science had pretty much figured everything out and all that sort of thing. So when you're presenting ancient immemorial spiritual wisdom, you often would present it, for example, um, as the aims of religion, the method of science, yeah. as Aleister Crowley did in, in <laughs> the Equinox, right? So it's, while Crowley will, of course, invoke ancient wisdom lineages and so on all day long, he finds the idea of hidden masters much more congenial because hidden masters are sort of atemporal. So they can be totally up to date. 
they can be, you know, they, they, <laughs> when, when they send you a message, it's by the spiritual telephone, you know, like yeah. taking the most modern up to date, um, mm-hmm. technological metaphor and using that. And, uh, so that in an era that sees itself as an era of progress is the way you'd go. But in the Middle Ages, for example, when in the Middle Ages in Western Europe, when no one sees themselves as an era of progress, uh, you have you would use different metaphors. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so uh, I know we're 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 getting into uh, into the the second hour here. Um, uh, we've got some more questions here around like the practice of Gnosticism, the what it is to be a practitioner versus a, an academic or both. Um, I want just want to check in uh, in terms of time if you've still got some time to chat. Yeah, we could chat for a bit longer for sure. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Um, well, yeah. So um, the and there's also some uh, great questions we've got near the end here that I want to make sure we don't miss. Um, but uh, so, well, and maybe so in keeping with more of where we've been in the previous part of the conversation, we'll, we'll actually ask these like later questions earlier and then uh, get into the practice question of like, so um, uh, Sean had a good one around, um, is there anyone that you either have explored uh, already or that you, you, you know is coming up uh, or is in the odd cast who you think would be like, it would be interesting to take them from the margins or the the, the 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 fuzzy areas that, that people don't know a lot about um, into a more centered religious or uh, spiritual discourse. I don't understand the question. What do you mean? Uh, who, which, which esoteric thinker kind of relegated to the margins of, of history or thinking would, would, what do you think would be bene- Who do you think would be beneficial to have their ideas move to the mainstream? Basically. Ah, I think I'm going to, I'm going to, that's a great question. I'm going to totally throw it on its head. The answer is Plato. (laughs) Not because Plato is considered marginal. Everyone knows who Plato is, uh, but because he has been filtered through philosophy departments so as to be this guy that is nothing like the guy you see if you actually read the dialogues. So, Mm. um, everything in what has been called the western mystical tradition you need to you need to read plato to understand its its lineage its its language uh he's the father of mysticism um Mm. he is so much in the dna of the way the the west and christian the christian west especially uh asks fundamental questions about what's real, what's true, what's a human being, mm. all this kind of stuff that Plato, Plato all day. So Plato needs to be taken out of the philosophy departments where they just kind of extract what they like to call the real philosophy from his dialogic format and put back into the dialogic format. And then people will realize like, oh my God, Plato's weirder and the West is weirder than we ever suspected. Ooh, I like that phrase. The West is weirder than we ever expected. Um uh, and then the, uh, the, the other fun question, um, which, so which of the three figures or which three figures could you pick again from either who you've profiled or you're going to be profiling that you'd love to put into a room together for a discussion? The, the Schwepp dinner party we talked about. Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, can they all understand each other? So do we have a kind of yes. gift of tongues so they can, we can all talk, right? Because otherwise it's not, we're not going to get very far. Um, I think Plato I, has you, to be you one. Can presume that much. <laughs> Plato has to be one because he is, uh, when I first went through Plato in the podcast, I called him the father of Western esotericism. I would now uh, go back and call him the grandfather because I don't think the classical period can really be meaningfully called Western. I don't think you really get anything meaningfully Western until you get the monotheism the, the Jewish and Christian and Islamic hate uh, injection. That's, that's when something that, you know, kind of roughly corresponds to the West starts to exist. So Plato's the grandfather of Western esotericism. And what I'd love to talk to him about is what the fuck were you on about, dude? <laughs> um, he's joking all the time. He's messing with your head all the time. He's never laying his cards on the table, but he's shaping the entire history of Western thought while he's doing it. So that's pretty, um, Amazing. And then I thought, why not throw St. Paul into the mix, right? That's a- <laughs> so this, 
this unlettered Hellenistic Jew, I mean, he's a little bit lettered, get him in. And he's had kind of crazy visionary experiences and encountered this uh, dead Messiah guy in a vision and maybe had a cosmic ascent. So he'd be pretty interesting to have at a dinner party. He can talk to Plato and they can kind of, you know, Plato's the guy who kind of invented the whole cosmic ascent uh, trope in the West. If, if he didn't invent it, he took it from somewhere else, or maybe he just invented it. So those guys would have a lot to talk about, but I'm, I'm really stumped for my third person to bring in that I'd want to talk to. If it could be someone from the future of West Nesotericism, I might like to pick Jakob Boehmer's brain. Interesting. He was a pretty heavy cat, very heavy cat. But if it has to be from people we've talked about before already, I mean, Pythagoras is a pretty tempting one because we really, we were pretty sure there was a guy called Pythagoras, but it's really, really, really difficult to get a picture of what he was doing and what his actual teachings were, aside from metempsychosis. He definitely taught that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, get Pythagoras and Plato in there. Um, <laughs> I'd love to see what Pythagoras thinks of Plato, because Plato was accused in his day of sort of plagiarizing Pythagoras. Um, the term plagiarism is a bit an anachronistic, but he was he was certainly accused of Pythagoreanizing, and then Paul as just the the weird um, yeah, awkward the guy at the party. The, who... the, the combination of people that would actually get Paul to shut up for five minutes, right? The, well, <laughs> you know, because I mean, for me, Paul always strikes me as you know not necessarily likes the sound of his own voice, I, you know. I mean, and I know there are people, because I tend to go on, so people say the same thing about me, but has a lot to say, right? And I think if you put mm -hmm. Paul in, in between uh, uh, those two uh, august folks, he, he might be stunned. He might, yeah, they might shut him up. Mm -hmm. Plato could pretty much shut anyone up, one gets a feeling, because he was a master with language in a way that uh, very few people have been in history. And you, you can imagine him, if he wanted to invest the time, I mean, maybe he was more comfortable <clears throat> maybe he couldn't speak at all. And, and that's why he wrote these incredible dialogues because he was more comfortable doing it in the uh, comfort of his own home in the, yeah. in the way like an internet troll might be too scared to really open their mouth in a face-to-face -face thing. But when they're online, they're suddenly they to ready rock. to rock. You know what I mean? But it's hard to say. We did, he didn't have a speaking career. Yeah. And although he, did, he was a teacher, he did teach. So he presumably could uh, utilize the gift of the gab that's an interesting yeah, uh, I mean, uh, exploration thank you for doing that yeah I, I i threw that in there because i i just had to um the uh yeah what would be what would be your three sean oh geez uh what about jesus speaking of g's you know you know i don't i i feel like there's enough people that would answer jesus for all three that i'd probably get the benefit of him somewhere down the road. I would be interested, interestingly enough, you know, there, there are folks that, you know, that are, that are closer to home. I suppose he would be one of them, but I would, I would throw in, oh boy, I, I, you know, your mention of Jakob Boma is a good one. Uh, I would throw in potentially, uh, you know, somebody like um, Martinez de Pasquale, right? Uh, you know, or a or a Louis Claude de Saint Martin, um, particularly mm. because they have that kind of there. At least when you when you start looking into like you know Martinism and the, the the French type of stuff, they have this kind of particularly Pasquale, you know, adopting things that seem you know almost like Lurianic Kabbalah, um, you know, grimoires and all this other kind of stuff. They seem to cobble together this kind of pre-Nag Hammadi, but post-Patristic kind of Gnosticism. It always seems to me that it's the closest approximation to classical Gnosticism while knowing nothing about classical Gnosticism. Interesting. And so, you know, so I've always found that fascinating where, you know, without a, without a, without a, without a map and perhaps just with a dowsing rod, you know what I mean? Um, you know, uh, perhaps made out of opium or something that, you know, that they managed to, they managed to, to 
strike water from from a long you know forgotten underground stream right and then you have stuff of course we know you know after 1944 1945 you have elements where it just kind of you know they they strike me as as the kind of folks who got the the closest to the classical gnostic sense without having access to the material so either pasquale or san martin would be one of those thinkers um, if you include Saint Martin, then you've got to in, then you've got to include the the shoemaker. You've got to include Jacob Bruma just simply to see one fanboy over the other, right? And uh, <laughs> yeah, because uh, Saint Martin considered uh, uh, Bruma to be his second master, so called. Um, I don't, you know, that's the yeah. It'd be, you know, it would be interesting. Yeah, Christ might be one of them. Pasquale would probably be another. And, uh, you know, for the third, I'm not, I guess it, it, I guess it depends if I, whether I want a party or a fist fight, I'm not actually, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not actually, I'm not actually sure. Nobody's ever, you know, I've thought about the question in relation to other people, but not in relation to myself. So I'd, I'd have to chew on that. Okay. Thank you for, thank you for turning it around. But yes, uh, Pasquale would be one of them, if only because he kind of comes at a, what I see as a, as a pivotal time for Western esotericism that ropes in uh, a whole bunch of stuff, like, you know, the idea of a, of a grimoire tradition, um, kind of uh, an approximation to the Kabbalah that Westerners know now, but still yeah. with a, with a, with a foot in the actual Jewish Kabbalah plus, plus of course, um, you know, some, some holdovers in the, the lived in context of kind of sacramental Catholicism, right? Like there, there's, there's yeah. kind of a leg in, 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 uh, uh, all these things. It's, it's where a whole bunch of streams, you know, meet and they're kind of forced to come together in a way that for some people it works and for others, it, it doesn't work at all. Like it's a, it's a, a mishmash yeah. to, so to hear that kind of from the mouth of the man himself, uh, that, and also, you know, yeah. he's a mysterious figure about which, you know, a lot is said, but none is known, right? So um, that for me would be simply from a simply from a curiosity point, rather than from a, a spirituality point. Believe it or not. Yeah, no, I can believe it. I can believe it for sure. Yeah. Um, um, well, this is actually a great uh, maybe a great segue into the the the, the discussion of like of practitioners of esoterica um, because a lot of these folks do that. Um, uh, and so, uh, and like you, you're talking to two people who define themselves as Gnostic. Um, uh, it, do you, uh, I mean, is there anything you can speak to regarding a benefit of, of the, um, like we, obviously we enjoy academia here, but like the benefit of the academic examination of esotericism to practitioners uh, is, can academics usefully engage with current practitioners? That's two different questions. So one is, okay. can pr practitioners fruitfully engage with academics and the other is turning it around um yes yeah. practitioners br broadly speaking uh constantly engage with academic work in western esotericism so that's that's definitely a yes they do it all the time i mean the uh every work written by an academic on western esotericism is eagerly absorbed into the esoteric milieu and immediately mm -hmm. becomes part of it uh, this is this is for sure, and the, you need look no further than uh, Hans Dieter Betz's um, English translation of the Greek magical papyri, mm. which yeah. I feel is the most anecdotally I feel is probably the most important grimoire in modern ceremonial magic, if you were to mm. in the English speaking world, because it's just seen as this like ur source for magic for like the ancient, the mm -hmm. real ancient stuff, but you don't know Greek, <laughs> so you got to get it from the English translation, right? Um, so that's totally true. And you have in uh, the, the broad spectrum of modern esoteric movements, people like uh, Druids and Neo-Pagans and all these sorts of folks who are often themselves, you know, uh, have degrees in history of religions and are often on a, a kind of spectrum of, um, how they look at what they're doing and part mm -hmm. of that spectrum is we're making it all up 
and and <laughs> and they, and they just openly saying, yeah, we're making it all up, but we're making it up based on often, you know, very high end scholarly reconstructions and stuff like this, yeah. you know. So mm -hmm. that's that's all there. Now, as for esoteric academics engaging with practitioners, I feel like it's super important. Um, for example, to give one example from my work, the only people who, this is a little secret of the, the guild, which I'll reveal to you guys. <laughs> for the first so time. Say you, this, for the first time. Right. Yeah. Revealed now for the first time, because no one knew this before. Uh, the only people who are adequate, like, re all, well, maybe not the only people, the only people I've encountered who are truly good scholars of ancient astrology are astrologers mm. uh that's probably like i think otto neugebauer who is this uh very very important scholar who's no longer with us he probably was not a astrologer he thought it was stupid but um for the most part <laughs> the only people who are willing to put in the insane amount of effort it takes to master this extremely abstruse complex system of correspondences and uh, planetary motions and different you know you know how complex astrology can get real astrology i'm not talking about like your your uh, newspaper horoscope i'm talking about the real stuff the real hellenistic tradition yeah. uh, the only people who are willing to put in the time are in some way engaged with astrology so they're practitioners in some in some way you know writ broadly because they might not be drawing horoscopes they might but they they somehow see it as um like a worthwhile they don't just see it as some kind of pseudoscience yeah which is this very common approach to ancient astrology, which is complete nonsense. So in that sense, you have to be a practitioner in order to present good scholarly historical work. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be, but you almost have to be. And you can take that. Um, you can take that. So people who work on ancient alchemy, the, the really good ones, people like my buddy Matteo Martelli, uh, Lawrence Principe, they're chemists. They're getting in the lab and doing, yeah. they're trying to reconstruct alchemical uh, experiments from texts. And uh, that work is unbelievably important for our historical understanding of al alchemical ideas. So to, if, to, to think you can understand ancient alchemy without getting into the lab is an absurd I think that has led to all kinds of nonsense being said about alchemy in my view. Mm -hmm. that's, that's another example where you kind of have to be a practitioner, yeah. right? Well, and that's, that's what I was, I was going to ask. So, the, you know, the, so you would feel that the, you know, there, there is, uh, I guess, a, a kind of mutuality, you know, in terms of, um, you know, both accuracy and relevancy and stuff like that. When the idea when when the academic and the practitioner come together and kind of, I, I guess when I when I think of folks who kind of successfully tread that line, like have a foot in each world, like examples that I would think of from from my realm, and, and you've named a couple in yours, but you know I would think of say um, like Ronald Hutton or uh, uh, yeah. Stephen Skinner, right, and uh, you know uh, both of whom have kind of done doctorates in the things that they actually practice. Do yeah, you, do you, Ronald Hutton's great because he's a druid, yeah, and he's like absolutely shattered the dreams of so many druids by saying that there were no druids. Yeah, <laughs> basically, <laughs> the druids were kind of made up. Yeah. But I'm a druid. Yeah, uh, he's got a great sense of so, sense of humor too. I mean, yeah, I also think about mm. Dr. Skinner and his work on Grimar stuff. Not only you know in terms of his scholarly work and unearthing, but the fact that he goes out and test drive test drives his material. Right. The, uh, so I, I guess the, you know, uh, so one of the follow up questions I had on there is that, you know, do you feel the one, you know, potentially compromises, you know, the other, like we've, we've just talked about a couple of examples that manage that uh, thing really, really well. Are those, are those the exception or can they be the rule, I guess? I don't know. Uh, I, I'm, probably not able to answer that question in the broad sense because i'm just not familiar with the whole broad scope of scholarship on aspects of western esotericism you know yeah. um is 
is it maybe a, a, maybe a different way to like approach it would be like, is there um, uh, like it, it, as an academic, do you find that there's like, say, pushback, like say uh, in the case of Hutton, where academia, because of research, has changes its its position on something that uh, a, a lot of practitioners have been taking uh, as gospel. And I'm using air quotes for those of you who are listening to the podcast. Mm. Um, uh, that that's like the the um, if there's if there's the benefits of of uh, the interaction that that's that's where the frictions are is like one side seeing it as true, one side seeing it as research. Um, it's what qualifies as good research in the humanities is not as easy to put your finger on as it is in physics or chemistry or mm -hmm. uh, hard science. Right. Uh, and I, that's a total understatement. <laughs> you, you can, <laughs> you can actually empirically say that was a bit of crap research in, in a field like quantum physics because he forgot to carry the two and the whole mathematical mm -hmm. structure is off, you know, something like that, something empirically verifiable, or that was good. The methodologically it was sound. You can't really do that in the human sciences. So um, what you end up having, and this is actually a very fascinating uh, social phenomenon that I'm part of and I find endlessly interesting, is a kind of shifting consensus that is built by all the scholars working together and maybe by you know esoteric practitioners as well as to what constitutes a good piece of scholarship and what doesn't. And we never agree 100% on what exactly fits into good scholarship. In fact, one of the things as academics that we do is try to tear each other down constantly, you know, in a constructive <laughs> way, ideally. Mm -hmm. But um, to some degree, I would say you kind of know it when you see it. You can kind of smell good scholarship. And even if there's a spectrum, um, there is something known as the occult echo chamber, and I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about. Like books that cite only other books that just cite each other. And there's n there's no, f and then you end up with the hermetic Kabbalah of the seven Saturnian dragon current 93, blah, 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 blah like hodgepodge, <laughs> which is Wait, I'm going to write legit. that down because I'm going to use that as the title of my first book. Sorry, just to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, my, my mixtape is coming out. Um, but you know what I'm talking about, yeah. like the, the sort of occult stew. Now that is living occult tradition, but it's not anything like historical scholarship, right? So that's an example of uh, the other end of the spectrum from something like, I don't know, a, a reputable history of the Theosophical Society where someone went back to the archives and read all the letters and did a handwriting analysis and figured out which ones Blavatsky wrote and all that kind of stuff. like like actual history of ideas, scholarship, putting actual dates on things, looking at cause and effect, the, the marks of the closest thing you can get to sort of scientific approach to human ideas, which is the sort of stuff you ideally find in universities and in peer-reviewed historical papers, right? Scholarship. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a, it's a gray area. and um, But we shouldn't be we we have to be careful not to do something stupid like say if you're some kind of esoteric believer or occult practitioner or something like that you can't possibly have good scholarly work to say you know if you want to look at in, within christianity who did the fundamental work of deconstructing the old narrative that moses wrote the pentateuch and their that the Bible was all like written in one moment and, and did, you know, sort of gave birth to biblical text criticism and showed that this is a composite document with many layers added to it and different, you can detect different agenda based on the layer and you can start to date the different layers. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. The people who did mm -hmm. this were Christians, right? These were like German Christian scholars, Lutherans and stuff like this, mm -hmm. who were pursuing this arguably very destructive agenda because that was for them a way of exploring uh, Christianity. It was part of their um, Christian academic practice. So like the, 
really, really, really great work on uh, that that deconstructs sort of what you might call a naive uh, literalist Christianity and and explodes the whole myth of Moses as an actual kind of guy who wrote the five books of Moses and all that sort of stuff was came out of Christianity came out of Christian scholarship. So to argue that those Christians, those guys couldn't actually do that work because they were Christians. So they had a vested interest in not doing that work. Well, history proves that in fact, they did that work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. QED. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there is something um, um, uh, about that, like the spectrum there that also makes me think of um, uh, like Alan Moore wrote an essay, Fossil Angels a while ago. Where, yeah, I read uh, that recently, actually. Ah, yeah. Funnily and enough. It's interesting, like in some respects, he's a he's more advocating for like go ahead and write your like seven Sailor Moon Dragons of of you know Stream 93, whatever. Um because he sees like he's like, go be creative and don't only focus on uh on a, being in a historical reenactment society. Like right. dress it up today, make it living, make it now. But he's talking um, he's speaking as a magician. Well, yes. <laughs> yes, that's true. He's not speaking as an academic. Although, I mean, what I think is interesting is that even on that spectrum, like, he's very often clearly calling out the traditions he's using. So if you wanted to do an academic study of it, you could be like, oh, yeah, okay, well, he's like, he's named, <laughs> you know, Crowley and the Hermetica mm. and, you no, know, etc. So Pro Professor Moore, I give him like a kind of honorary professorship in the, in the Invisible <laughs> College, is a very well read <laughs> Uh, gentleman yeah. for sure uh and he knows his shit but he's also a creative artist and a writer and and um it, yeah doesn't want magic to be an open-air museum he wants magic to be magic and he yeah. wants good scholarship presumably to be good scholarship but mm -hmm. the two are not the same thing no yeah yeah and it's a uh, uh, i'm uh, i'm uh, i'm not necessarily sort of arguing for or against him there i think it's more just just i think it's a notable uh, uh, sign or like a um, uh, discussion point around that that notion of like uh, the tension between the two of them and, and that spectrum. Um, mm. um, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I well, oh, it, sorry, it's go. no, go ahead, Father Sean. Oh no, because I because I had I had a follow up <laughs> question. Uh, okay, well, I would just say like <clears throat> from Alan Moore's perspective, he might he he's uh, a uh, very creative dude. And he's doing a lot of really interesting experiments with what you might call magic as a living uh, practice. Uh, stuff that, you know, is known to blow people's minds. And he might have had one eye in writing that essay on people who are, in fact, going back to the Greek magical papyri and being like, I'm doing the authentic spell because it's in this papyrus from the sands of Egypt. And he's saying, and he's <laughs> saying like, what the fuck are you on about? If like what what the hell does the sands of Egypt have to do with Northampton in the twenty first century, which is where he's <laughs> coming from? You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Get off your fourth. Get off your hoary sands of Egypt high horse, because you're not a scholar. You're a magician. So do magic. Stop being. Tr stop trying to be a, a second rate scholar and, and get on with doing some some magic. Yeah. Well, and he uh, he worships a snake that he also acknowledges is a fraud. <laughs> yeah. So he's like. I'm not, there's no sense of, of definable truth here that he's pointing at. <laughs> yeah, not, that's a very modern uh, approach, right? It's, it's not mm -hmm. only yeah. modern, but it's, it's a very characteristic of the modern. Like, we don't really care about the question of truth or ontological mm -hmm. uh, groundedness. And you see that already very explicitly in Crowley. Crowley is actually very ahead of his time in that sense. He says it, it doesn't matter what demons are. All that matters is certain effects follow certain uh, actions and you if you mm -hmm. want a certain effect you do the actions and that's that's kind of the only baseline um theory you need to do ritual magic that reminds me of a, oh. a, a quote in in one of the early you know set of correspondences letters you know in the hermetic order of the the golden dawn one of them was writing to another one about the existence of the secret chiefs and and the other one answers basically some version of you know whether or not they exist as secondary the universe behaves as if they do and yeah. uh, i always found that to be an interesting thing i did have there were there were two follow-ups one's kind of related and one's kind of not because we actually did have a, a, a listener 
question that I wanted to to sneak in there. But the first one is I was going to ask, oh, cool. you know, this this question is coming straight from the secret vault of the Adepti and maybe above, maybe a secret uh, not pertaining to my grade. But I got to ask, are you are you a, are you a practitioner yourself? Stay esoteric. <laughs> That is a perfect answer. <laughs> um, thank you for thank you for answering that way. Um, I think we had to ask no. if that makes sense. I was sense. just curious, um, and I had uh, and I had to not answer. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Um, no worries. Um, the, Sean, the, sec the, the, the second one uh, comes actually from a member of the AJC, um, so I wanted to Great. put that out there, uh, particularly because I know they're they're in in school studying a lot of this stuff the question is is it tenable to be and this one's totally different from all the stuff we've talked about but connected on the tail end is it tenable to be a, a researcher of gnosticism or esotericism in late antiquity in an academic setting and and how would you recommend somebody go about postgraduate research postgrad uh learn definitely learn coptic well, you have to know Greek and Latin, uh, 100%. I recommend Coptic and Syriac in a big way, uh, especially Coptic because the, because you have to know the Nag Hammadi trove, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but Syriac, there's a lot of stuff in Syriac that's really important. Get those languages under your belt and then find a supervisor who is into that stuff. And if you show up at their door and say, I, I know these languages and I have this really interesting research project. They'll say, hell yeah, get on board and we'll find you some funding. <laughs> if you think you can do it without learning those languages, you're no, no, you can't. You could maybe do it. Without is, uh, it. Yeah. It, is the, is the language question essentially like, because without that, you're only ever relying on other, like other, yeah. uh, you're not doing primary right, research. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You have yeah. to be able to address the texts. If you're doing, if, I mean, if you want to do something on like, uh, reception of Gnosticism in modern occultism or something like that. Don't definitely don't bother learning uh, Coptic because none of those occultists learned Coptic either. But if you're <laughs> trying to do something on late antiquity, which is I think what the question asked, uh, you have to learn the languages of late antiquity in which the stuff is written. If you want to study Manichaeism, which is often considered part of the pleroma of Gnostic movements in antiquity, uh, <laughs> you will need a lot of other languages as well. And then you get into wonderful, weird stuff like Sogdian and Chinese Ooh. and a bunch of other languages that um, most scholars of late antiquity don't get around to learning. But huge troves of, of Manichae texts are in these languages. And so people learn them just to read that stuff. Yeah, I've always found that area fascinating. And I know nothing about it. One of our... One of our, one of our uh... Uh, uh, one of our deacons did a presentation on Gnosticism in the Far East. You'll find it on our channel, and it's the exploration of Manichaeanism in China. And mm, it, fascinating. It's wild. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the the thing that um, uh, I just want to mention that I think, like, whatever I hear you say, uh, and gentle listener, you should check out this text. Um, that I'm always like with a bit of chagrin because I know you're often referring to these texts that I can't read the primary source of. Um, but, uh, but it's, a uh, it always makes me wish I could, cause I think there's, there is something I think fascinating about trying to get at what they're saying, not what someone else thought they were saying. Yeah. Unless you're studying the someone else, you know, true. Exactly. Yeah. Then you want to read what someone else is saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, in a way, if, if we look at our primary sources of Christianity, which are mostly in Greek, and I think there's a, a general consensus that, uh, that Jesus was a Aramaic speaker. You're already not in the primary language. Do you know what I mean? You're already in the, yeah. in the sort of language of speaking to the wider Eastern Roman Empire, but translating from what the guy was speaking, which is mm. spoken only in the Far East, uh, you know, like the Levant and, and further east. So um, already you're not kind of going back to the original in, in air quotes, mm -hmm. but it's the best yeah. you can do. That's fascinating. Yeah, the 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 the, the issue of the uh, the the source text, I think, well, and, and even that that sense of uh, appealing to the the sense of the ancient, you know, like the um, mm. you know uh, the 
the the real truth is the actual you know translation or what have you um uh yeah there was something oh sorry go ahead no that's it um oh, okay. that, that whole question of um you know authenticity is i kind of feel like it's a, it's it's so 1980s mm. you know what i mean like it's kind of old hat but but it's a live issue in many an esoteric current which tries to prove its ancient wisdom lineage you know what i mean mm -hmm. but texts are texts yeah. they're written by people they change they get received the languages shift uh mistranslations happen sometimes the most interesting uh esoteric doctrines come about through mistranslation creative mistranslation as it's been called and uh mm. you come up with interesting new stuff you know uh, I, I loved what you said about um, the Gospel of John, was it, which is that it was the one of the best or maybe most notable mistranslations in in history. <laughs> oh, the um, word, yeah, well, yeah. The beginning of the, was the word, yeah. That's a funny one. <laughs> uh, that's like that could be a whole uh, a whole uh, uh, research project right there. Um, yeah, Pro someone's probably done that actually. Oh, that's true. Surprised. Actually, even as you I know, say it, that's yeah. There's, that's, there's many that's... works on logos theology and antiquity, and they inevitably look into the semantic sphere of the word logos, and many mm -hmm. of them will point out, you know, the fact that it it means almost anything except word. It never means word. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what was I going to mention? Um, oh, and actually, uh, speaking in, in this now, like uh, re the listener question idea is the. Um, we also got a question from somebody on Reddit when I mentioned that we were going to talk to you. Um, and he, uh, sorry, they asked, uh, interested in hearing your take on the disagreement over whether or not the Gospel of Thomas qualifies as a Gnostic text. I'm not sure if that's, if that's a thing you have a take on. No, I don't. I don't know. It's a very, okay. very fascinating uh, document. It's super um, difficult to make sense of. And I interviewed two really, uh, I think, very interesting scholars on uh, on it. One is Charles Stang, who uh, sees in the Gospel of Thomas this very strong theme of doubling, of which mm. he links to Plotinus and Manichaeism, both of whom have a very strong idea of a, of a higher self, like a celestial or hyper-celestial self that the human being needs to identify with. And he sees this in the Gospel of Thomas very strongly. Then I interviewed uh, a scholar called Ivan Nurishnikov, who is also deeply invested in the Gospel of Thomas and knows it intimately in its original, well, not it's not it's in in, in its non-original Coptic form, and sees exactly the opposite. There is no doubling in the Gospel of Thomas. It's very much emphasizing unity, and um, mm. it's a kind of super monist thing. So, Gospel of Thomas is a wonderful and intriguing text. Is it Gnostic? If I had a strong uh, baseline definition of Gnosticism to give you, I would tell you yes or no, but I don't. So, right, yeah, we, which again refer to our earlier conversation on exactly how to define that too. Yeah, um, this has been uh, this has been really great. Um, is there any questions you still have for us or anything like that? Anything you want to ask um, uh, either like Talk Gnosis or Sean as part of the AJC? No, uh, listeners will not be aware that we had a, a, a really nice chat before we started recording, and I talked about or asked about the AJC a little bit and got some background. It seems like a very fascinating uh, flavor of, of Christianity. Um, so, so no, I, I would say thank you guys so much for um, having me on and, and engaging in this really interesting conversation. I'd say conversation I, actually is me babbling mostly, but I feel like... Oh, I love this. This is great. <laughs> Uh -huh. I uh, uh, we tried to show up as best we could, but uh, yeah, no, this has been great. Well, um, hopefully, um, I know uh, I know you're pretty busy, but uh, maybe uh, sometime in the future we can have another another good chat. That'd be fantastic. Stay yeah. esoteric, guys. Stay esoteric. <laughs>